This year marks 45 years since Roe v. Wade legalized abortion in our country. Since 1974, generations of Americans have braved the elements and marched on Washington to pray for our nation and be the voice of the most vulnerable members of our society, the unborn. As a member of the Pro-Life Caucus, I will continue to fight for legislation that values and protects the sanctity of innocent life. I applaud these courageous participants and I stand with you in this movement. There is no more basic human right than the right to life. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose, gentlewoman from Florida, seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in strong opposition to the absurdly titled Born Alive Survivors Protection Act, Abortion Survivor Protection Act. This bill is yet another attempt by the majority to intimidate women and providers of abortion care by imposing restrictions that are redundant at best and life-threatening at worst. Time and again, Republicans have charged that politicians, not women and their doctors, know what is best for women's bodies. Enough is enough. Today is a reminder that women's reproductive rights are constantly under attack, and I will never waver in fighting back. This bill is completely unnecessary. It has always been illegal to kill newborn infants, and to suggest this legislation is anything more than redundant obstruction for women accessing health care is outrageous. Instead of spending time on unnecessary legislation, my Republican colleagues should work with Democrats to fund the government and protect 800,000 young people, our dreamers, from deportation to countries they have never known. Mr. Speaker, Americans face actual real problems every single day, so let's get back to work. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlewoman's time has expired. What purpose, the gentleman from Tennessee, seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of H.R. 4712, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, which was introduced by Representative Marsha Blackburn. This year marks the 45th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision Roe v. Wade. Unfortunately, with this decision, we've seen the number of abortions occurring in the United States growing each year. According to Planned Parenthood 2016-2017 annual report, abortions make up 96% of the organization's pregnancy resolution services, whereas prenatal services drop significantly. Additionally, Planned Parenthood has performed more than 1.6 million abortions over the past five years. Now more than ever, it is crucial that we celebrate the sanctity of life by encouraging and supporting pro-life legislation. The Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, which I'm a proud co-sponsor of, affirmatively states that if a baby is born after a failed abortion attempt, doctors must exercise the same degree of medical care on that child as a baby born on any other day. If doctors refuse to do so, they will be held criminally accountable for their actions. As a proud West Tennessean, I believe that we must the give a voice time to the unborn and preserve the life and the health of all children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman from Wyoming is recognized for one hour. Mr. Speaker, thank you. During consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purpose of debate only. I now yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlewoman is recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of House Resolution 694, which provides a closed rule for consideration of H.R. 4712, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. This important act ensures medical care and legal protection for abortion survivors, protects their mothers from prosecution, and holds abortion providers accountable. Mr. Speaker, this bill is not duplicative, as some have suggested. It simply augments current law, the Born Alive Infants Act and the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, which the House passed in 2002 and 2003, respectively, with very strong bipartisan support. Current law includes in the federal definition of a person, infants who are born alive, 
no matter the method of birth or the stage of their development. Current law, Mr. Speaker, also provides criminal penalties for physicians who provide, provide partial birth abortions. What current law does not provide, however, is enforceable protection for those children who are born alive after a failed abortion attempt and denied care. Nor does it provide criminal penalties, Mr. Speaker, for those who perform or knowingly ignore these actions. Mr. Speaker, there are horrific stories of children born alive during abortions and either gruesomely left for dead or deliberately killed once born. Even more, the abortion industry is fully aware of the risk of a child being born alive during an abortion, especially if the abortion occurs once the child is gestationally 18 to 20 weeks old or more, the age at which we know a child is able to survive if given the proper care. Take the story, Mr. Speaker, of Gianna Jessen, an abortion survivor who testified before the House Judiciary Committee in 2015. She said, quote, instead of dying after 18 hours of being burned in my mother's womb, I was delivered alive in an abortion clinic in Los Angeles on April 6, 1977. My medical records, she said, state born alive during saline abortion at 6 a.m. Thankfully, she continued, the abortionist was not at work yet. Had he been there, he would have ended my life with strangulation, suffocation, or leaving me there to die. Instead, a nurse called an ambulance, and I was rushed to a hospital. Doctors did not expect me to live, but I did, she said. Later, I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, caused by a lack of oxygen to my brain while I was undergoing and surviving this abortion. I was never supposed to hold my head up or walk, but I do. She concluded, if abortion is about women's rights, what were mine? Some abortion providers, Mr. Speaker, are, are unwilling to respect the Born Alive Infants Protection Act, such as Priscilla Smith, who testified at a House Judiciary Committee hearing in 2015, saying she didn't believe it would be a violation of the Born Alive Infants Protection Act if a baby were killed outside the womb as long as the baby weren't, quote, viable. Ms. Smith went on to assert some fetuses are never viable. She made these claims notwithstanding the fact, Mr. Speaker, that viability is not a factor, even under existing law, in determining whether an infant deserves protection under the law. The law protects infants born alive at any stage of development. And therefore, these abortion survivors are entitled to the same degree of care that would be received by any other babies of their age. The bill we're debating today, Mr. Speaker, would impose enforceable criminal penalties for clinics that do not treat survivors with proper medical care. And there is, sadly, evidence that clinics fail to provide this care. Deborah Edge, a former abortion clinic employee, wrote an op-ed about her experience. She said, quote, I was the doctor's right-hand person in the operating room. And just like other employees of Dr. Gosnell, who we know was one of the most horrific abortionists to date, guilty of first-degree murder in the cases of at least three babies, she saw the abortionist puncture the soft spot in the baby's head or snip its neck if it was delivered alive. The abortion providers, Mr. Speaker, who neglect to provide professional care to these babies, or worse, who kill them once they are born, must be held accountable. Finally, I believe it's very important to note, to counter some of the things you will hear from the other side of the aisle, that this bill provides crucial protections for women. This bill protects women who seek abortions by prohibiting them from being prosecuted under the law. H.R. 4712 also empowers women. It allows them to sue abortionists who don't provide protection for aborted babies who are born alive. 
This is very important, Mr. Speaker. Take the case of a woman named Angela who went to a clinic in Orlando, Florida when she was 23 weeks pregnant. Angela received pills to begin contractions to induce an abortion. After an hour of labor, Mr. Speaker, Angela delivered her baby alive into a toilet. Angela had her friend call 911, 911 to request help to save her baby. But when the paramedics arrived on the scene, clinic staff reportedly turned them away. The fire department's incident report said they had no contact with the patient. After the death of her son, Rowan, Angela wrote the following, quote, the very moment I saw my son was alive, nothing else in the whole world mattered but Rowan's safety. Only one thing mattered to me, getting Rowan help. I begged repeatedly, she said. Tragically, the abortion clinic not only refused, but also apparently sabotaged Angela's call for help. The bill that we are debating today, Mr. Speaker, would give women like Angela the ability to sue abortionists who do not comply with the law's requirements to give medical attention to children born alive like baby Rowan. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I urge support for this rule to allow consideration of H.R. 4712, and I reserve the balance of my time. The, lady, the woman from Wyoming reserves the balance of her time, and the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney, for the customary 30 minutes. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, today we will consider the 61st closed rule of this Congress, part of a disturbing and familiar pattern. Republicans are running this House with no regular order, no hearings on legislation, and one closed rule after another. Uh, Speaker Ryan and the House Republicans recently set a record as presiding over the most closed session of Congress in history, and now they are adding to it. With no transparency and their continued effort to silence any debate and any dissent, this chamber feels more like the Russia House rather than the People's House. Now, I know Donald Trump is enthralled with authoritarian rulers and authoritarian rule, but that doesn't mean you guys have to follow suit. Today's rule provides for the consideration of H.R. 4712, yet another partisan and extreme Republican bill that is completely unnecessary and aimed, at solely, uh, aimed solely at pleasing the majority's right-wing base. The simple truth is that this bill is filled with inflammatory language intentionally designed to politicize women's access to health care. It is clearly about nothing more than advancing an agenda to take away access to safe and legal abortion. With this bill, House Republicans are meddling in the decisions that should be left up to doctors and patients. This is, that is not our job. Th and, and this, what we're doing today, is not about serious legislating. If it was, you would have gone through regular order. This bill is nothing more than a very cynical effort to give Republican members of Congress something to point to when they join the anti-choice march in Washington this week. Republicans are recklessly playing politics with, with women's health, and they should be ashamed. My Republican colleagues claim that this bill is just a reinstatement of the current Born Alive law. First, if that were true, then this bill would be redundant and unnecessary. And second, Democrats would support it. When the original law came to the House floor in 2002, it passed by a voice vote. We all agreed. But this bill is not a reinstatement. This bill takes the current functional law and adds a radical inclusion of criminal penalties for doctors if they violate the unreasonable requirements of this legislation. Under current law, when a child is born alive, including during an abortion procedure, the health care provider is required to care for this newborn and apply a standard level of care given to any and every child. However, this bill takes the law a step further requires that the doctor immediately transport this child to a hospital without exception, whether it is safe for the child or not, or face criminal punishment up to five years in jail. This bill could create a chilling effect and limit access to safe legal abortion for women since physicians may fear prosecution. Patients need and deserve access to compassionate and appropriate medical care, and this bill um, is, quite frankly, unconscionable. Mr. Speaker, there are times when immediately transporting a newborn to a hospital 
that may be miles or even hours away may result in grave harm to that infant. Such, the, such decisions must be left to the professional judgment of doctors and clinicians. Doctors and clinicians oppose this law because it prevents them from giving the best care to their patients. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists strongly oppose this legislation, calling it, and I quote, gross interference in the practice of medicine, end quote. Current law is working and it should not be radically changed for a partisan talking point. Right now, there are a number of tr truly critical issues that we ought to be considering on this floor, not a soundbite for a anti-choice rally coming up uh, in the next couple of days. You know, a clear majority of Americans, I should point out to my colleagues, seven out of 10, say they believe a woman should have the right to safe legal abortion, according to a Quinnipiac University poll. By stark contrast, fewer than three in 10 Americans, that's 29%, approve of the job Republicans are doing in Congress. Maybe you ought to get the hint. People don't like what you're doing. This should be a wake-up call for Republicans to end their partisan crusades and start doing their jobs. It is time to focus on the real pressing issues we face. The Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, which nearly two million kids and their families rely on, has been in limbo for months as states are beginning to run out of money. Now Republicans are pushing a continuing resolution that fails to permanently extend CHIP. Permanently extending CHIP would not only give these kids and their families the certainty they need when it comes to their health care, but the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office says it would also save $6 billion. I thought you were the party of fiscal responsibility. Do the right thing and you could save $6 billion. But Republicans would rather kick the can down the road once again. The authorizations for community health center funds and maternal, infant, and childhood home visitation programs will remain expired. That's not even included in this uh, partisan CR that we're going to see a little bit later today. Each and every day, 122 dreamers are losing their protected status and ability to work in this country, and my Republican friends don't seem at all bothered by that. People who are first responders, saving lives, people who serve in our military, people who work in our companies, who are such great members of our community, are treated like this in such a rotten way, and yet more in action. The administration just stripped 200,000 Salvadorans legally residing in the United States of their protected status, people who are obeying our laws, who are working here legally. They did this while admonishing Congress uh, to provide these same people with an enduring lawful immigration status, and yet we have a Congress that is so dysfunctional, you can't even agree on what to have for lunch, never mind move anything forward that's positive with regard to protecting these important members of our community. The debt limit needs to be raised to ensure that the U.S. is able to pay its bills. Communities are urgently in need of resources to fight the opiate epidemic that is killing 91 Americans a day. They're tired of your press releases. They want the funding to be able to respond to the crisis in their communities, and yet nothing in the CR, no urgency here in Congress. And more needs to be done to help repair damage left by de devastating wildfires and hurricanes that have ravaged this country. I just came back from a trip to Puerto Rico. The place is still in great disrepair. And our initial response to that hurricane was disgraceful. We have a special obligation to these people, our cit fellow citizens, to better respond. And yet, uh, there's no urgency here. And most importantly, where is the budget agreement that sets the budget caps for fiscal year 2018? House and Senate appropriators can't even begin negotiations on an omnibus funding bill until they know their top line numbers. That means that this will not be the last short-term continuing resolution that we see before this House. And until there is an agreement on the budget caps, we will continue to see the Republican majority keep kicking the can down the road. We will see CR number five in mid-February and maybe CR number six and, and, and shortly thereafter. When will the Republicans finally stop negotiating with themselves and instead reach out to Democrats and work in a bipartisan way and actually get the job done that we were sent here to do by a constituents. We are just hours away from another Republican shutdown and instead of working on a bipartisan agreement, we are here discussing this, an inflammatory bill that will impose criminal penalties on doctors uh, and allow Congress to intrude on medical care decisions. When are we going to put the radical rhetoric aside and actually do our jobs and tackle the real issues sent us, uh, the, the Americans sent us here to tackle? And here's kind of the icing on the cake. 
You know, I mean, we, we're, we're, this government shutdown is looming. We're, you know, it's, it, we're going to run out of money and on Friday. All hell's going to break loose if we can't um, come to some sort of agreement. You would think we'd all be working together to get this thing done as quickly as possible. But then we're told we're not going to, we're, we're going to consider the continuing resolution rule after this, and then we're going to consider, we're going to debate it. But we're not going to vote on it until later tonight, after 7, maybe even later. Why? People might ask, are, are, we, are we delaying action on, on a bill whether, d d that decides whether we keep the government open? Oh, we, we just found out. Um, President Trump is doing a political rally with Republican members of Congress in Pennsylvania. So the political rally is more important than the well-being of the American people? What are you guys thinking? Shame on you. I mean, this is a moment of urgency and instead of doing political soundbite legislation, and instead of doing political rallies in Pennsylvania for an election that doesn't happen until March, members of Congress ought to be here working to keep the government running, to come to some sort of accommodation on the Dreamers, to make sure community health centers are, are, are funded, to make sure our veterans get the funding and the health care that they need. This is atrocious, what you are doing. If the American people could sue you for political malpractice, you would be in deep trouble. I urge my colleagues to oppose this rule, to oppose this bill that would severely undermine women's access to essential services like abortion. And I urge my colleagues to cancel the political rally and get back to work. And with that, I, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from, from Massachusetts reserves the balance of his time. Members are reminded to direct your comments to the chair and not uh, deal with personalities of the president. Uh, the gentleman. The gentleman yields back, and the gentlewoman from Wyoming reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. I reserve my time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentlewoman from Wyoming is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, could I inquire how much time is left on each side? The gentlewoman from Wyoming has four minutes. And the... From Massachusetts has three minutes. Uh, is, and is the gentleman prepared to close? Uh, as long as you don't have any other speakers, I'll prepare to close. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not lying in wait over here, Mr. Speaker, yeah. so it's fine. The Mr. gentleman Spe from Massachusetts is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I, I yield myself the uh, remaining time on our side. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, first of all, um, I want to say to all my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, that this process is lousy. This is yet another closed rule. Uh, the bill before us didn't even go through committee. There was not a hearing. There was not a markup. It just miraculously appeared uh, right before an anti-choice rally, and here it is, take it or leave it. That is not the way this place is supposed to be run. At some point, no matter what your ideology is, no matter what you believe about some of these issues, you have to be for a more open process, a more deliberative process. This diminishes the House of Representatives. Uh, this is not what the people, I don't care what the political party or ideology may be want from their Congress. They want a more open and transparent process. And Mr. Speaker, uh, this bill before us, as I said before, um, is a soundbite. Um, it's going nowhere, um, it, but it's been introduced and we're going to be voting on it purely for political purposes. Mr. Speaker, this morning, um, the majority whip announced upon, and I quote, upon conclusion of debate on H.R. 195, um, that's the CR, the House will recess until 7 o'clock p.m., end quote. Recess? I mean, recess? I mean, with all that's at stake, we're going to recess? I mean, this isn't a time for recess or a political rally. Shame on Republicans who are delaying action in this House on, uh, the, uh, on moving the process forward on a continuing resolution um, to try to buy some time to make it better, hopefully, so that you can earn bipartisan support. Shame on them for going to a political rally instead of staying here and doing their job. This is, it, this is the time to responsibly fund government. Those of us on the Democratic side have a lot of issues with what the House leadership is ramming through in terms of a CR. We were not part of that discussion. Not, um, um, we were not asked what our values are and what we think is important. This is purely a, a, a product that the Republicans negotiated with Republicans. My hope is that we have time to make it better. But when you recess until 7, not to make it better, not to negotiate, 
but so that Republicans could go to a political rally? Shame on you for doing that with all that's at stake. I mean, our soldiers don't want us to recess. You know, those that, de that, believe, that depend on community health centers don't want us to recess. Our veterans don't want us to recess. And yet, everybody's perfectly fine on the other side of the aisle with taking a break, no big deal, no rush, nothing, as we look, get closer and closer to this crisis. At some point, we need responsible leadership in this House. And that begins with a return to regular order, a more open and transparent process, a respect for the views of the minority, and it means prioritizing uh, the business of the American people. Gentlemen, time and I will has expired. say the funding the government is more important than a political rally in Pennsylvania. I yield back my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from Wyoming is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I agree with uh, my colleague on the other side of the aisle, my colleague from Massachusetts. There, there is shameful action underway uh, in this Congress. And that shameful action is the fact uh, that I will say once again that we are in a situation where our men and women in uniform have not received the appropriation that they need to do the job that we are asking them to do. And the reason they haven't, we have passed an authorization bill through this body. We have passed an appropriation bill through this body. But the Democrats in the Senate are refusing to act. The Democrats in the Senate, who hold the key to getting 60 votes in the United States Senate, are refusing to act. And the reason they're refusing to act, Mr. Speaker, is because they want amnesty for illegal immigrants. And they are holding hostage the extent to which we are able to provide resources to fund our men and women in uniform. Mr. Speaker, there is a, a tremendous amount of urgency on both sides of the aisle. And uh, I respect my colleague from Massachusetts. I respect his frustration. But I do not respect, Mr. Speaker, the extent to which he is accusing us of shameful behavior. We are on this floor today talking about a bill that will protect babies who are born alive after abortions. The, the shameful behavior is that on the other side of the aisle, they want to talk politics. They want to talk posturing. They want to talk process. They don't want to talk about babies who are born alive after abortion. I know why they don't want to talk about it, because it's uncomfortable. They would rather ignore that it's actually happening, Mr. Speaker. But we can't ignore it. We have an obligation in this body to ensure that we provide protections and care for those who cannot for the most vulnerable among us. Mr. Speaker, it is a moral obligation to ensure the protection of every baby born alive. I am proud to be here today on behalf of this rule, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I urge adoption of both the rule and the underlying bill, H.R. 4712, so we can continue to do what is right, what is morally required of us, and that is to protect and nurture and make sure we've provided safeguards for the unborn and for those who are born alive after abortion. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time and I move the previous question on the resolution. The gentlewoman from Wyoming yields, yields back and the question is on the order, the pre, ordering the previous question on this resolution. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, on that I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote from the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed.